We are in for major disruptions. Everything lies in the hands of the gatekeepers. How soon will they allow it? We look on the internet and we see so much of Tesla these days. Mm -hmm. What of his discoveries are coming true? You're speaking of Nikola Tesla? Yes. Okay. And then there's the Tesla Motor Company <laughs> by Elon Musk. Nikola Tesla was the vibhuti of the electrical age. It's a, <laughs> it sounds dramatic. But we have had scientists who were vibhutis for something. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a vibhuti for, I think Sri Aurobindo put it this way, the whole of modern Europe and the development of modern Europe and the mind of modern Europe yes. had to be embodied in one person before it could eventually become the collective uh, reality. It had to be embodied in one person. So he did everything which subsequently became specialized sciences and the mindset with which he approached things had to be embodied in him and then imprinted into the collective. So just as we have vibhutis and we normally recognize them more for their spiritual uh, interventions or their military interventions like Shivaji was a vibhuti which saved India from uh, otherwise what would have been uh, complete uh, uh, destruction in darkness. You have a Joan of Arc in France who came for that intervention to protect France for the work she had to do uh, subsequently and so on. You have, we recognize them more in their in that aspect or as artists at best who initiates a whole new line of art we don't recognize science also has its vibhutis and Einstein was not one, although he's still popular and it's my opinion, I may be wrong, but I'm giving you my opinion. He's very popular, he's projected as, oh, Einsteinian uh, physics, but what it did, it brought a revolution in thought, but it did not change anything of physics. It did not help the growth of physics or of technology. Um, similarly, a famous person does not make a vibhuti. And uh, so you had Tesla's arch rival who was uh, mm, Edison mm -hmm. and he is very much popularized or oh, he made more than a thousand patents and all that. Tesla had disdain for him. He said Edison does not think. He is not genius. He keeps trying the hard way. You know he made for one light bulb, he made uh, they say some thousand attempts, he tried this and then that and then that and then that. Waste. That's not genius. And light bulbs already existed before. It's just that they were not lasting. Tesla did something which was so radical, nobody could imagine possible. He invented what is today halogen lamp, neon lamp, um, CFL lamps, just as an example of light bulb, but that's not it. His real achievement in light creation was a light bulb, which was let's say, spherical with a button in the center. That's the word he uses which electrically pulsated at very high frequencies, gave off pure white sunlight. And it was cool to the touch. Now, it, you may say it is the closest to current uh, tube lights or CFL bulbs or neons, but it was way beyond. It used so little electricity and gave such a bright light for the little electricity used that you could have one bulb in the room running on a battery and it could light up the whole place and with sunlight quality light. And all of this is part of his patents. He demonstrated it at that time. And you have to ask, why is it that these were not turned into actual technologies? Instead, Edison's filament bulb, which fuses every so many months, became the norm. That is your gatekeepers who held back, who suppressed the real forward march. And what Tesla did was he initiated on Earth the electrical age. All of today's electricity, all of today's technology built on electricity, including the current AC transmission systems, the motors, AC motors, which were considered impossible during his age. Scientists, the greatest scientists of the world said, the AC motor is impossible. Why? Because AC, remember, is current going one way and then the other way, and one way back and forth. And they said, on the average, there is zero current. How can you use this to spin something? Right? It seems logical. Mm -hmm. The best minds of the world said this. And Tesla not only said they are wrong, he knew how to build it, 
he began to design it in his mind. He had the genius which saw it. And a few weeks down, somebody asks him, what happened to your AC motor? He says, I've already built it. Now I'm testing it. Where is it? Oh, it's in my mind. <laughs> and in his mind, he's testing it and he finds out these are the defects. He optimizes it. When the whole thing is complete, he sits in his lab and makes all the parts to specification. And here you have a working AC motor, high efficiency. That's genius. That is the vibhuti of science. And he initiates every electrical thing, just as Leonardo da Vinci initiated all the different sciences and the character of the mind of Europe. He initiates every electrical thing, including robotics, remote control, um, X-rays, uh, radio waves, etc. And he went well beyond, like I said, with the bulb alone. But he had other things. And one of them had to do with transmission of energy, transmission through radio waves of uh, sound, of images, television. He had even designed a system for the television broadcast where you would have multiple channels. Now this was unheard of because the basic radio technology was in such an infancy that it was more uh, uh, oddity. And he's already designed multiple channels for transmission through a single uh, broadcaster. And you know, in when they first made radio wave transmitters, it had a distance after which it fades out. His first design of the transmitter was designed to transmit all around the globe. The design of it was resonating with the Earth's size and with the ionosphere and the Earth's surface. The very first one, it's like his perfect machine, he designed it and pop, he manifests it. So there's something so extraordinary in the work he was doing. And then there are experiments he was doing whose true nature we still don't know. And the only place I have found some idea of those experiments is in Savitri, where Sri Aurobindo describes these as achievements of science. So there's one, there's one line where Sri Aurobindo has the, the, I think the Rajasik ego say, I have made water harder than steel yes. and made iron soft as velvet, yeah. right? What is this water hard than, harder than steel? Where do you find water harder than steel? Look through all your scientific literature. And Sri Aurobindo is saying, I have made, in the name of uh, humanity or that uh, arrogance of science, you will not find it except in Tesla. And you will of course find it later on in uh, water when it's frozen to near absolute zero, it becomes almost hard, harder than steel. But that's not normal water. It's no more water, it's just frozen. Water, while it's flowing to be harder than steel, have you ever seen that? Mm. What did Tesla do? He had these gigantic tanks. He found a way to put the water under enormous pressure. Now, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but it is in the range of some thousands of pounds per square inch. I have a vague memory of 40,000 pounds per square inch, but I may be wrong. But it's something in a huge, humongous number. And so from this tank, you have a water jet coming out at let's say 40,000 pounds per square inch, shooting out. And when it's shooting out, that's strong enough to cut through steel. And what he does in the experiment, as someone observes him doing, he takes a bar of steel, lifts it and slams it on the water flow. What do you think will happen? Normally, if water is flowing, the bar would go right through, right? Yeah. Here it bangs and bounces off as if it's hit steel. And yet it's flowing liquid water. Imagine what that means. What is he doing with this? Of course, the technology subsequently is used even today for cutting steel plates. So there are industries where they cut with laser, but there are industries where they cut with water jets at high pressure. And there are benefits to, to both. But he was not using it for cutting. He was doing something else with it. Um, we have other experiments which he did, where, which were built on the concept of resonance. Uh, he called it his earthquake machine. So in the middle of New York City, he sets up his device on a tall building and it starts oscillating the central pillar of the building with knocks and builds up the pulsations until the entire building starts shaking and the ground in that area starts shaking and there's a mini earthquake that takes place and the police come rushing looking for the source of this and they find Tesla takes a hammer and breaks his machine because he doesn't have enough time to shut it down or he can't shut it down so he breaks it with a hammer and he's happily exclaiming, I did it, I did it. 
What did he do with pure air pressure, the compressed air, the kind which you fill your uh, bicycle tires with or car tires with? With that now, he has a hammer pulsating. How much energy does it take? Practically nothing, right? You could do it with your hand. But the timing of the pulsation, catching the resonance and building it to a point where it creates an earthquake. So how a tiny airflow could be made to shake the earth or how flowing water could be made harder than steel. And it's all of this really resonates directly with the Vedic sciences and the implications of that which Aurobindo speaks of. To be able to draw out any quality out of any substance, out of a hard substance to draw out softness, out of soft substance to draw out hardness. And you see this in Sri Aurobindo's comments on this in uh, the architecture in India. You have hard granite made to flow like fluid, soft, velvety substance. And that's what you see in the architecture of the old temples. And evoking that contrary quality of granite, that's one of the, the skills. That's when the art has reached its uh, true, true mastery. Granite is the hardest stone possible to cut. Most carvers will not touch granite. They go for uh, marble because it's much softer or limestone which is soft, easy to chip. Granite you have to hit harder to chip and in that very hard hit you are likely to break something equally. Imagine you are making the perfect beautiful face of a goddess and while you are doing the perfect cut of the nose, you chip a little too hard and the nose breaks. You have to start all over again. You make a fine eyebrow one side and you try to make an exact mirror on the other side. It can't be not a mirror image. You chip a little bit and the whole thing is waste. And you have to start all over again with something which is the hardest material. And interestingly, precisely because it is hard, you can make the finest curves, the finest lines, the most subtle uh, lines on it. The soft material cannot make those subtleties. It can only flow on the surface but not a line which is subtle. So it's as if in the very nature of the resistance of that material is a potential for the extreme of softness and uh, artistry and subtlety. And to be able to capture that and draw it out as if from the material, that's the real art. <laughs> and something like that Tesla was experimenting with among his lesser known experiments. Bulk of it, of course, he focused on electricity and in his later years, with his transmitting tower, he wanted to broadcast power, not just television and radio, but power so that he said, anybody sitting anywhere on earth can plug in, not into your local electrical plug, but into his, the aerial, and draw electricity to light, light up instruments anywhere on earth from his single transmitter. And when the promoters for him discovered that they could not put a bill, they stopped the project and dismantled his transmitter. Several times he was attacked, his laboratory was set on fire. He lost many years of work because he used to minutely document everything which was necessary to prove that he had actually done it. And because of that documentation today we can say that Tesla was the first inventor of radio, not Marconi. In fact, Marconi stole that from him or stole the concepts. And uh, you have to ask why your textbooks still say Marconi did it. And he fought, Tesla fought back, it, it went to court. And the final judgment came a few days after he died, where they said, no, Tesla's notes prove that he had done it well before. Why is it Edison is promoted, Marconi is promoted, all the names are promoted and Tesla is completely forgotten. The reason for that is his technology went so far ahead that it would revolutionize all our life today. That bulb is one example, but what he did, which was the most revolutionary was he was able to, through this oscillation, tap into the electricity which is in the ambient space and energize that to be able to run a motor. So there's a record of him assembling a little device which is about this size. He plugs it into his car, which is electric by the way. He has an electric motor with his AC motor or whatever. Switches it on and then he can drive for hundreds of kilometers, miles in the US. He drives for hundreds of miles and Nothing used. 
no fuel. He's drawing electricity from the air, from the space. And this was too disruptive. So he had to be pushed back by the then gatekeepers. And there's a statement he makes. He says that the present age may belong to you people, but the future age is mine. So he's the creator of the electrical age, but what he created then is still classified. When he died, so every year before he died, on his birthday, interestingly, he would hold a press conference and he would describe all the current uh, discoveries he's made and his inventions. And in the last few years, he was describing how he had created a device, he called it the death ray. He could beam a high voltage pulsation, which would go like a pencil thin beam at a distance of 200 miles and knock out any aircraft or missile potentially. Simply cut right through like a laser and knock it out. And he describes the technologies, the components which make for this. And he says, I have done it. But you do not find the evidence. It's as if all that has been buried. He has the patents which are in public and a whole host of patents which are still classified. So when he died, uh, the US government seized 14 crates of his papers, of which 10 crates were sorted and sent. He was a US citizen. But it was the Office of Alien Properties that took over his crates and sent it to his family out of the US in Croatia. And they kept four crates of documents which are classified. And I believe in 2004 or five, somebody applied for declassifying those documents under the Freedom of Information Act. It was the US Air Force that responded saying, this is still classified. Now he died in 1944, I believe, right? Something like that. Uh, yeah. And you have to wonder what from 1944, 60 years later, the US Air Force considers worthy of classification because if it goes into the hands of the enemy, they might take advantage of it. Now, what is it that 60 years ago was invented that even today you do not want the enemy to know about, which obviously you have used in your super secret <coughs> programs? And a hint of this we get. One was, of course, the energy that he was able to draw. A hint of this we get in some patents which describe flying devices and some of the experiments which he did uh, with these death rays and uh, high voltage electricity. And we don't know the full scope of what he was able to do. <laughs> How do the gatekeepers correlate with the deep state? <laughs> well, they are the ones who form the deep state. Uh, they are the ones who hold back uh, technology, direct funds to suit their interests, uh, prevent common man from uh, becoming independent so that humanity may be always dependent, enslaved and so on. So they have also become gatekeepers of knowledge. And that's why I gave this example. Why is it that Tesla's, all his inventions are still kept buried and the importance of who he was is hidden. Because if people know that he did all this, they will ask, well, where is all this? Why can't we do it? Why can't we replicate? And all the descriptions are there in the patents. And in one of the patents, he actually writes, Remember Tesla, I've not spoken about Tesla much, so maybe I'll share a little more about him. He met Swami Vivekananda through Sarah Bernhardt. Oh. Why am I taking the name of Sarah Bernhardt? Well, she reincarnated as mother's granddaughter. Here. So there's an old connection of <laughs> interested people. So Sarah Bernhardt is a French actress. She's in the United States. She's a devotee or admirer, at least, of Swami Vivekananda. And she takes uh, Tesla to him. And there's a list of uh, Helmholtz, if I remember right, a whole list of four or five senior scientists of that age who were attending Swami Vivekananda's lectures. And this is now 1893 onwards. He was there for a few years after the Chicago conference where he was suddenly came into prominence. And he's talking to them about Vedantic theories of spirituality, of life, but also of matter. And he describes how matter emerges out of consciousness. This is part of the Vedantic teaching. And they are coming um, fascinated by this. And Tesla is on record saying that this is the only theory which makes sense. Okay, And 
Then he has a conversation with Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda says it should be possible to prove that force and energy, uh, matter and energy are equivalent. And that matter can be reduced to force or energy converted into matter. And Swami Vivekananda notes that this scientist Tesla used to come and attend every one of his lectures. And he was a man who was so busy, he had no time to eat. Such a man would come and attend every lecture. And he said that he had given him the task to prove that matter and energy were interchangeable and that he had successfully done it. Tesla himself says that yes, this is doable and I have done it. Well before Einstein, well before the famous E equals MC square becomes popular in the minds of people, he has already achieved that, demonstrated it, not as a theory, which is what E equals MC square represents, it's just a theory. He has done it with his technology to demonstrate it. So, uh, Tesla was deeply involved in the Vedantic studies. There's a letter from uh, of correspondence between Tesla and a British scientist by the name Kelvin, Lord Kelvin. He writes to Tesla thanking him for his, uh, for, for hosting him. He had met him. They had many discussions. Now he's going back to England. He has gone back and he receives from Tesla a crate full of books, a parcel of books. He lists four or five of the books. They are all about Eastern philosophy, which Tesla is sending him after a conversation they have had. And he says, all the way back on the ship, I was thinking about how the ether uh, could be the basis for electromagnetic uh, interactions. Now, all this points to a whole different class of science based on the ether, which they were working on. All of the then physics was built on the ether and perfectly correlated with the Vedantic thought and the Vedic physics, which is ether based. As of 1905, after Einstein's special relativity, the ether is thrown out. And today, if you mention the word, your paper will not be published. And this is why, what, why am I saying all this? This is to show you the gatekeepers of knowledge. They do not want you to know the deeper ranges of science on which the whole of that physics was based, on which Tesla's physics was based, and all the other scientists. And they were based on these deeper ancient Vedic traditions. Now, to highlight this further, there are, there's a quotation from Tesla where he speaks of how the knowledge of the yugas and the cycle of kalpas and the underlying akasha, that is the ether principle, all of these are the most, the only uh, meaningful explanation for the universe and reality. I've seen in one of Tesla's uh, patents, because I've studied a lot of them, looking for clues of what he was doing and the kinds of things he did. In one of his patents I've seen, he writes, and this is all about to do with energy transmission, and he writes, the ancient Vedic philosophy, I'm now paraphrasing, uh, the ancient Vedic philosophy of an underlying akasha and a prana which creates worlds in the akasha to form atoms and particles is the only sensible explanation for matter. And there he has used these words akasha and prana and the Vedic uh, theory and so on. Why is he writing this in his patents? One of the things he realized very quickly, they could burn his laboratory and notes, but the patents once filed are public document. So what he did was he hid all his knowledge, including some of his advanced concepts into his patents. Now for a patent of technology, you just need to say how you do it, this is patented. Why is he describing this theory? Because he wants you to understand how he thinks. What is the basis of his technology? And once you begin to catch that, you can say, oh, now we understand how his transmitter worked, how he extracted energy, how he did this, what was the source of that light, and why the light has the color of the sun, because it is using exactly the same electrical process that is in the sun, now replicated here in his bulb. And so the whole, let's say the gates begin to open. And so the gatekeepers need to close the gates. So they needed to suppress Tesla's importance to that age, to push him out as a foreigner, not a US citizen. His paper is still classified by the Air Force, of all things, because there's something involved with flying and with related technologies, and uh, I suppose the death ray also. And 
uh, he's somehow buried in the textbooks. The only place you find his name is in the unit measure, the unit of measure of magnetism, where the unit is called a Tesla, as in remembrance of him, or in a little uh, curiosity, which is called a Tesla coil, which produce high voltages. The interesting thing of the Tesla coil is, to this day, nobody has been able to create an equation which describes perfectly the Tesla coil behavior. Now, if you take a standard transformer, you have an input, you have an output, the proportion of the uh, turns makes for the proportion of the voltage change based on the core and its uh, material. material properties. You can calculate the efficiency, the frequency, optimum it, performance, etc. All reduced to mathematics. But the Tesla coil, unusually, has one coil of just two turns, another coil of many, many, many turns. But it's not so much the turns, but the total length of wire which is critical, which matches the resonant frequency of light speed inside the wire. So that effectively the electricity moving back and forth from one end to the other is resonating. And just these two turns at a huge distance are pulsing, like his earthquake machine. They are pulsing softly with a little bit of energy. And what's built up here is a humongous energy, humongous movement, which creates shooting lightning bolts thrown out in 6 inches, 12 inches, depending on your design and its efficiency. It does not work like a conventional transformer. It's based on resonance of the earthquake machine principle. How a tiny action repeated with very little energy can produce a ripple in the ambient ether and shake it up in a way that produces these lightning bursts. So all of this is part of a technology which has been held back. And of course there would be other things which he has done later which we don't even know about. Maybe there's an intention to bring to disclosure some of these things, but I believe the gatekeepers are strong and even disclosure would have to go through smaller steps even if it's speeded up. One of the things you do see today, for example, which is heading to a disclosure is the reality of life on other planets. In the last three years, a series of uh, shifts in NASA's statements. Now suddenly they discover Mars has lots of water, Venus has lots of water, the moon has lots of water, so many uh, moons of Jupiter and Saturn are full of water. Water seems to be everywhere in the universe. Whereas barely four years ago, the picture given was water is nowhere. And now they say Mars has so much water, if you dig down barely six inches, you find water. So you can just dig down and drink water. It's, it's that easy almost. And when they made that movie about someone going to Mars, it was like a dry desert that they had. We have had earlier a discussion about uh, extraterrestrial life. Mm. And uh, you might want to see some of that if you've not seen it. But the fact that suddenly there's this picture changing of water being available everywhere, new planets being discovered which are Earth-like, coming every few months in the newspaper. It's all as if preparing you to realize that, preparing you for the disclosure of life. It'll start with discovering bacteria on Mars perhaps. And uh, NASA's head, uh, the, what's his, this, I don't know his designation, the president of NASA, whatever it, the head is, he made a statement a few months ago that we are in the threshold of discovery of life, but we are totally unprepared for it. Within two years, we will definitely find proof of life on Mars. He said it like that, as openly as you can get. And NASA is just launching, or has just launched, <coughs> a spacecraft which will look for signs of life on the Martian surface. Whereas so far, all the crafts they sent for landing did not carry the necessary means for life measurement, intentionally perhaps. Mm -hmm. And the last one which went was sniffing out methane and suddenly finds there are seasonal fluctuations of methane in the air, which only points to life. There's no other way that seasonally methane increases or drops, but it's very, very small. So we don't know where it comes from. That's the current explanation. So we're being prepared. So in spite of the big gatekeepers who would rather delay things and hold back technology, there are those who are slowly pushing forward and one can hope that it will happen sooner rather than later. Is there any voice today promoting the future in technology?
Yes, there are. There are plenty of voices. Uh, unfortunately, though, the authorities are more deceptive because the gatekeepers ensure that the authorities are the ones that they control. So they give you a picture which uh, as if misdirects your attention. And the real visionaries are the ones who are not officially heads of the field, who are often treated as uh, um, as on the side. Fringe. Fringe, on the fringe would be the right word, yes. And if you look at some of the fringe visionaries, you get glimpses and they are the ones who are right. And a lot of it is happening in a soft disclosure through television and science fiction. One of them was very interesting. You remember there was this big movie which was made about an Indian invasion, which was uh, Independence Day. Mm. Okay, It was about bad guys coming and how they're blown up with a nuclear bomb. So nuclear energy saves us. Okay, that was the first narrative. Then they made Independence Day Part 2. And in that it starts with this opening scene where from the crashed ET craft, they have been able to reverse engineer all the technologies. Now they have flying saucers, flying disks, they have a base on the moon and the hero of the Independence Day 2 is flying these devices. And all of Earth has undergone a massive shift within a few years because of reversed engineered alien technology. Interesting. And it was one of those disclosure suggestions saying, you know what, all we need is a little bit of that and we can make a radical change. <laughs> of course, the fact is we have had many alien crafts which have crashed, which have been recovered and technologies have been reversed engineered. It's not a, something new. The incident in Roswell was one of the famous ones, but there have been many others. In summarization, <laughs> could you say a little of the supermental's effect on the world today? The supramental consciousness being essentially a consciousness of oneness. There's nothing which is hidden. All is known, all is revealed. So increasingly as the supramental consciousness begins to influence the mind of humanity and then the life of humanity, one of the results is that things come out into the open. And the mother spoke of this. She said that because of the supramental action, a day will come when you will not be able to keep secrets. <laughs> What's happening now, of course, you can still say it's happening through the mobile phones and the data being taken into centralized servers, you're being monitored. That's one side. But the other side is on the level of pure psychology, ideas are open. And the framework of the internet allows you to exchange ideas freely bypassing mainstream media, bypassing mainstream gatekeepers and authorities. And so what is fringe today, called fringe by the who? By the gatekeepers, actually is mainstream at the level of common man in many areas. It's just that we are told that is fringe, when in fact they are the ones who are pretty much locked up, locked up. And at some point, the number of people who are already thinking differently will uh, grow so large that you will have a sudden shift and the gatekeepers will become irrelevant or they'll be just thrown aside. And even that may happen in steps. So first a layer of disclosure and then another and another, but it will speed up. I want to share with you a graphic which shows how a disruptive technology starts small then it hits a level which is about 20% when it suddenly begins to shoot up. It hits 80% usage and after that it has completely destroyed the old technology and it goes in a vertical direction. Mobile phones would be something like that. When they first came in, only the most wealthy could afford. You didn't have enough transmitters. You had large areas where you had no signal. And then it suddenly began to pick up and it went from the 20% to 80% very rapidly within three, four, five years at most. And then now it's like you can't live without a mobile phone. You must have one. It doesn't matter how powerful it is. You must have it. And then all the other things suddenly have been thrown out. The landline based connection is just reduced to high speed internet at best. But you don't really use it for the primary purpose for which it was made. Now if you see the 
track of a disruptive technology like this in the curve. And you see disruptive technologies over the last 100 years. You see one happening, and then 20 years later another, 10 years later another, 5 years later another, and then a cluster of them in the next 3 years, and a cluster of them in the next 2 years. And it's as if the pace of disruptive technologies is increasing, but also they're happening more fast, but also they're rising more rapidly in steepness. So it's as if the technology has got sufficiently subtilized or virtualized that now all you need to do is push a software update and suddenly your phone is able to do so much more. Or in the manufacturing uh, state, where you, in the manufacturing machinery where you make your mobile phones, you just have to tweak the design a little bit and suddenly you have a radically new technology. If you look at the transition from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, 4G to 5G, what has changed? The chip is exactly the same. The broadcasting antenna is exactly the same. The only thing is the software. And maybe some of the software is optimized on the chip level. So you have dedicated transmitters, dedicated processors for 4G, 5G, etc. But inherently nothing new. So it's as if you're able to implement it faster and make radical changes faster. The, if you remember when Tata came out with the nano car, they had been manufacturing regular cars. And the dream of Ratan Tata was to make a car that would have carry a whole family of four, uh, parents and two children, but at a price of car, price point less than 100,000 rupees, which at that point was about $1,500, let's say, less than $2,000. Can you have a car for less than $2,000, which will equally perform as well as any other car? Mm. Of course, it will be a little smaller, etc. So he had a team working on this. The team made at least 30 patents of novel inventions. Now think about it. No one has tried this before. Do you think no one else could have done it? Just nobody chose to do it. Once he decided to do it, they made all the necessary innovations, 30 new patents. Then what does he do? He has his people design the car down to the components, test it through simulators. You've never made a physical car. You've tested it on a physical level, on a simulation level. Optimize it on the simulation level. You do a crash testing. The car hits a wall and you see the stress patterns going into the windscreen within the frame of the metal frame of the car, the plastic, the doors, see where they crumple when something hits on the side, strengthen those parts, run the simulation. Everything is done virtually. The design is done virtually. And then he has already a supply chain making regular cars. They send the design to those people. The parts come back, assemble it, you have a working prototype, you make one last test, pass it through the qualifying requirements for the government, there you have to have a physical car, it's done, and you switch on the manufacturing chain and you're churning out cars. The whole thing from beginning to end could be done within a year. Imagine what it was earlier to design a car, what it took, how difficult it was. So it's as if the technology has reached a point where the ability to create a new technology and make a disruptive change takes less and less time. So what you see in this graph is where earlier the curve was like this, now it, becoming, it is becoming steeper and more frequent until it's become almost vertical. And the point of verticality is now, let's say in the next two years, where if you did nothing, just looking at this graph, it would look like you're heading for a massive shift. And some of it is going to be just the transition to electric cars and the solar energy based society and so on. Uh, but other things will be other disruptive technologies. We, we are yet to fully appreciate what. Batteries, for example, is one of the disruptive technologies. They've been suppressed for the last 20 years. Elon Musk was about to buy one of the most advanced battery technologies for some billion dollars. And an unknown person, anonymous, bid higher than him to buy it out and suppress it, to kill it. That would have allowed a threefold or fivefold increase in the battery power. But already in India, in IIT Madras, I believe it was Madras, in IIT Madras, they created an iron-based battery. You do not need expensive lithium, you do not need those rare earth metals. Iron-based battery, which has higher repeatability, that means you can charge and discharge. Typically your lithium ion batteries last 1000 charge dis discharge cycles. This can go for 50 times more. 
is cheaper in cost and is non-polluting. Now, if this could be done in IIT Madras, do you think, and it's not one of the most advanced labs, do you think it couldn't be done in one of the most advanced labs? And having done this, somehow it's not being taken up. It should have been patented by now, and if this is a few months old information, by now the most advanced labs should have been concentrating to optimize this technology. But they will not. Because if you do this, then you will have cheap, more efficient batteries all over, replicable all over. Lithium ion batteries are priced because the lithium supply of the world is controlled. So the price can be artificially raised. The same way as you control oil flow to raise the oil prices. But iron, you cannot control because it's there everywhere. It's the most abundant element in, on earth. So that technology must be suppressed. But hopefully with this point of uh, uh, transition which we're approaching, we will have capability for people to pick up the technology. Oh, here, they did it. Maybe I can replicate. And maybe people will do it in a garage. I don't know. <laughs> so we are at a point of transition and that's why I'm pointing to the supramental force action to bring transparency where nothing can be hidden, including technological capability and knowledge and discoveries. And when that becomes reasonably open, the gatekeepers will become irrelevant. Humanity will just bypass them and uh, we will have much more rapid progress and open, transparent uh, evolution of technologies and with it, of course, knowledge and with it, hopefully, the inner awakening will follow. Otherwise, just an external technological shift without the inner change would only destroy us. And Sri Aurobindo ends his description of the ideal of human unity describing all these dangers. He says the only thing which can prevent these dangers from destroying things will be if there is a sufficiently radical change in consciousness. And the supramental consciousness is working for that first and foremost. That being made, the rest will be inevitable. Thank <laughs> you.